Good evening and welcome to the Trumbull Board of Education regular meeting of Tuesday, November 10th, 2020 at 7 p.m. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay, correspondence, Mrs. Marcel. Yes. Uh, the Board of Education received five emails since our last meeting. Liz Parazan feels that the signs at Trumbull High School are political and tied to Black Lives Matter and the radical left, and she feels they should be re removed. Peter and Laura Yavrosasevich uh, doesn't understand why we gave up the cohort model and brought all children in since numbers are climbing and the school system continues to have cases of the virus. Rasha Tarek believes that bringing children back doubles their chances to be exposed. Her child, she complained, has been in quarantine twice and wants to know why don't we do what Westport and Fairfield has done because they've decided to rethink being in and like Stratford that plan to close immediately. Victoria Kwan and Kavita Maheda wanted to thank the Board of Education for the temporary remote learning program. And they said that they also other families would like to tell us that they are very grateful for that program. Those are all our emails this time. Thank you, Mrs. Orsell. All right, public comment. We have no public comment this evening. I'm going on to the superintendent report. All right, so the superintendent update, uh, I'm not gonna talk about reopening during the superintendent update, but when we get to the section of the agenda, I will talk all about reopening. Uh, I do wanna give a, a quick update. Uh, about Mary Ellen Way. Uh, on Friday, November 6th, uh, last Friday, I was joined by uh, board member Marie Petiti and board chair Lucinda Timpanelli, and we went to Jane Ryan, and there was just a wonderful uh, celebration where um, everyone got together to uh, really highlight that uh, the new street sign that was placed there, Mary Ellen Way. And, and uh, those who knew Mary Ellen Bolden as a principal in our district, I unfortunately was someone who, who didn't ever get a chance to meet her, but I've heard so many stories about what a wonderful person she uh, was, uh, what a, uh, just a great spirit she was. And uh, I really feel like I missed out on meeting a, a wonderful person. I did meet a bunch of really excellent people along the way though. Ben Lipinski had reached out when I first got on board and he and the JR Fathers Club really helped shepherd this through the, the town council and getting uh, Mary Ellen Way approved by the town council. Lots of staff, students, parents, Mary Ellen's family joined the celebration. Um, and I, I just encourage people to drive by over at Jane, Jane Ryan and, and take a look at the sign. And what I think is really profound is just the name. They, they, they called it Mary Ellen Way. And she sounds like she was such a role model for people that it's a great name for a sign. Uh, that to do it the Mary Ellen way would be a really positive way of doing things. So I think it's a wonderful testament to the person and uh, the people that she's impacted. And that's that's the extent of my update. Oh, okay. Okay, next is the board chair report. And uh, yes, Marie Petiti and I enjoyed going to the dedication ceremony of Mary Ellen Way. It was nice to see the number of people that attended, plus the students. So it was held on Friday, November 6th. And uh, we made it before it got too cold and too dark. So it was a very good event. Okay, next, I would like to take a moment to say a few words about Tony Pijar, the Dean of Students at Trumbull High School for the past 16 years. His last day was October 30th. I worked with Tony for several years at Trumbull High School. He made the Dean of Students position a vital and essential part of the school community. His work has touched many lives for the better. His expertise in communicating is an admirable quality as he was able to achieve resolutions to issues via dialogue peppered with genuine respect and openness. 
He is a trustworthy and honorable person. And I wanna thank him on behalf of the board for all he has done for our students and staff at Trumbull High School. Good luck, good health, and much happiness, Tony, in your retirement. Godspeed. Okay, next. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to move the agenda item um, letter C from Attorney Dugas to agenda item letter A, right before we approve the minutes. I'll second that, Lucinda. Okay, thank you, Jackie. Mrs. Marcel seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mike? Aye. Aye. Jackie? Aye. Um, Scott? Muted. I didn't hear Scott. You're, you're muted. Yes. Oh, okay. And yes, sorry about that. I was muted. Andy? In favor. Thank you. Okay, all in favor, good, and that passes. Okay, Attorney Dugas, come to the podium, please. Thank you. Uh, this is the uh, last of the contracts that are due to expire June 30th of 2020. Uh, this is the custodian uh, and maintenance bargaining unit contract. Um, I had mentioned this briefly, I believe, in a non meeting when we were talking about, I think it was. Uh, the food service workers, but the contract, um, what we worked out is a one year extension of the current contract with a 2% increase and a 0.5% increase in uh, health insurance costs, uh, which is, of course, similar to the other uh, agreements that I brought back to you. Um, one year extension is basically uh, the result of the fact that because of COVID. And the fact that um, the custodian and maintenance staff was very busy during the summer uh, around COVID and cleaning and so forth, we never, frankly, uh, had an opportunity to engage in any negotiations, frankly, other than some, some informal conversations uh, in the month of August uh, with uh, the usual pressure from the state to either have an agreement or enter into a waiver or go to arbitration. Uh, the union inquired as to whether we'd be interested in a just a one-year extension uh, because we were sort of at a funny point uh, in between uh, Mr. Isagi's departure and Dr. Semmel's arrival. Um, I thought it was a good idea, uh, not only on the, on, on the facts of a 2% two, two increase and the increase uh, of a half percent in cost here, but especially uh, because I thought it was important uh, that he uh, and um, Mr. Hendrickson get an opportunity to get their hands around what's going on with uh, custodial and maintenance um, and um, have a better opportunity uh, to negotiate a contract uh, of a longer duration. Uh, so it's um, along the lines of the other agreements. Um, it's a one year extension and um, consistent with the others. Um, I engaged in conversations with Dr. Semmel uh, in supportive of it. Uh, and I would recommend it to your approval. Okay, let's uh, make a motion to accept this. Can I have a motion? This is Scott. I'll make a motion to accept the Trumbull Custodial Maintenance Employee Bargaining Unit Agreement as presented. Tim Gallo seconds. I'll second it, Lucinda Jackie. No, Tim already seconded Jackie. Oh, okay. Um, okay, I want to know if there's any questions for Attorney Dugas. Nope, not for me. No, everybody okay? All right, I'll take the vote. Mrs. Fatiga? Uh, yes, in favor. Uh, Lucinda Timpanelli, in favor. Tim Gallo? I'm in favor. Mike Ward? Yes, in favor. Jackie Norso? In favor. Scott Karen? Yes, in favor. Andy Palo? In favor. Okay. Or I guess we're good. Thank you. Unanimous. Thank you, Attorney Dugan. Thank you, Madam Chair. If we could circle back to yeah, we are. The we do it right now. Rep report. Yes, we have the student board of ed report. Um, I don't know if Jack Allen is on or Gabby. Thank you for. Yeah. Uh, Jack is on, and we're bringing him in right now. Thank you. And I'll bring in Gabby as well. Thank you.
Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, all right, so good evening, everyone. I'm happy to see you all today and thank you for another great meeting. I would like to say that at Trumbull High School, as we near the end of the first quarter, students are optimistic and hopeful for what the, the rest of the year will bring. While we have all certainly had our struggles throughout this experience, both students and faculty, I'm proud of the Trumbull Public Schools community for coming together and making this possible. To me, it seems that students are beginning to adapt to the new environment that they have been placed in. And many of the problems that we initially faced are now far behind us. I feel now that as a community, that rather than feeling our way around the situation, we can begin to look uh, towards the future and what the rest of the year can bring. There's one issue that has been circulating throughout the community mostly among students and their parents that I would like to address. It is possible some of you have seen the petition that has been posted online. However, I find it suitable to bring this issue into light for this meeting. As far as I'm aware, Trumbull High School's policy for half year classes is that an A grade and zero unexcused absences result in a student having the opportunity to be exempt from midterms. Given the current state of the school, most especially Regarding virtual learning, there are many things that can lead to an unexcused absence that are unfortunately complete, uh, completely out of control of a student, such as Wi-Fi issues, technology issues, et cetera. While we all agree it's <clears throat> that attendance is important, a hardworking student with high achievements should not be penalized for things out of their control. I feel this problem needs to be addressed. Granted, students will be required to take midterms this year. Apart, apart from this, there's word spreading that Trumbull High will be trying to implement cer certain things this year, for example, Spirit Week. I would like to comment that students are very excited for these types of things, and I think it is pivotal to the success of students that we do our best as a community to maintain some type of normalcy in these un uncertain times. Thank you for listening. I'm excited for the rest of the year. Thank you. Jack, I just have one suggestion for you. You, uh, you need to take this up with the principal. Make sure that you that you have spoken to him about your concern about the the grade and the midterm. Okay. And if you want to go first, you can go to your house principal first and then to the principal. But you should see one of the administrators at the high school. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Are are we complete? Is Gabby on with you, or is it just you, Jack? Hi, I'm here as well. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Gabby Biondi, and I'm a senior at Trimble High School. We discuss the faith of many clubs at Trimble High School and are happy to say that clubs have or have not started. While they may look different this year, we encourage every student to visit the virtual club page and be involved. I also wanted to note the outstanding achievements from Trumbull High School sports teams. The girls field hockey team went undefeated with a 12 to 0 record and were named the regular season championship champions and the FCAC division champions. The girls volleyball team also had a very successful season with an 11 to 1 record and were named the regular season champions as well as the FCAC division champions. Lastly, the boys and girls cross country team were named East division champions and the boys had an undefeated season. Just wanted to give my congratulations to all of our amazing teams. And although this, I'm sure the students wish they could cheer you on from the stands, we are there with you in spirit. Um, Jack had also mentioned about Trumbull High School Spirit Week this year, and the student council is happy to announce it. That will, it will be running from November 16th to November 20th. Students, whether online or in person, are encouraged to participate, and the days are as follows. Monday, Vacation Day. Tuesday, Decades Day. Wednesday, Pajama Day. Thursday color wars, and lastly, Friday black and gold day. Currently other events are being planned by the student council, so please keep a lookout for that. As the marking period comes to an end, we will not forget the hard work teachers have put forth and continue to put forth every day. And while the indecision of when students will return to, sc to school full time remains, students are optimistic for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to the next action item. I need a, a motion for the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting. Lucinda, I'll make it if you want. Go ahead. 
I make a motion to approve the regular meeting minutes of 10 27 2020. I need a second. I second the motion. Second motion. Okay. We have a double second. Tim and Mike. Okay. Anyone have any changes they would like to make to the minutes? Everything okay? Okay. Let me take the vote. Please, uh, Justin, who said it's in Benelli in favor? I'm in favor. Tim Gallo yes, in favor. favor. Mike Ward in favor. Scott? Yes, in favor. Okay, Jackie? In favor. Okay, Andy Palo? In favor. Thank you. We'll accept those. Thank you very much. Okay, our next item is personnel, Dr. Summer. All right, we have a couple of important uh, personnel pieces. First, we have a uh, retirement, which is Lauren, and I hope I don't mess up her name, but Lauren McLean science teacher at Madison Middle School since August 1999, retiring effective June 30th, 2021. Uh, and also we have a request for leave of absence. Jennifer Angelovic, a grade four teacher at Middlebrook Elementary School, who's been there since November 2006, is requesting that we ex uh, approve a personal leave of absence without pay, effective November 24th through June 30th, 2021. And this request does comply with the Trouble Board of Education leave of absence policy 4150. And our recommendation is that you uh, accept and approve both of these. Okay. So I would make that motion to approve the retirement of Lauren Peclayan and um, the request for a leave of absence from Jennifer and Jolivic. Um, Lauren was a science teacher at Madison Middle School since August 1999, and Jennifer was a fourth grade teacher at Middlebrook Elementary School since November 2006. I need a second. I'll second it, Lucinda. Backing ourselves second. Okay, any questions or anyone want to make a comment? No? We okay? All right, I will take the vote. Mrs. Petiti? Yes, in favor. In favor. Lucinda Cipinelli, in favor. Tim? I'm in favor. Hi. Yes, in favor. Um, Jackie? In favor. Okay, Scott? Yes, in favor. Andy? In favor. Thank you. That's in favor. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, and that's good with that? Yep. With that? It's all good. Okay, our next is the reopening, Dr. Summer. All right, so reopening updates a little bit um, longer as it's as it's been. Uh, and first, I, I do have to just give a, a a real shout out to all of the staff that are working in our in our district. Um, from our teach, I don't want to just start naming groups because I could leave one out, but all of our staff are just doing amazing work. When you think about um, the importance of our children having the opportunity to learn. The folks in our buildings every day are making it happen. Uh, it's such a critical part of what's happening in our world right now. And, and the staff at Trumbull are, are just doing great work. And I, and I think people should just be incredibly proud of all that they're doing, given everything else that's swirling around the world at this time. So uh, I want to give them all a, a true shout out. Uh, as we continue to, looking, to look at our schools, given the current data, uh, clearly, the numbers in Fairfield County and our state continue to rise. Uh, for the weeks of October 18th through the October 31st, which is where the Department of Public Health is asking us to be looking at, the leading and the secondary, secondary indicators for Fairfield, Fairfield County are still, they're actually listed as high now. Um, so that must be paid attention to in terms of uh, what they're putting on their website. However, for the same two weeks, Trumbull is listed as having 14.2 cases per 100,000. This is up from six per 100,000 two weeks ago. Uh, and there's at this point now a positivity rate of 3.5% in Trumbull specifically. Um, currently we have 14 out of our 592 certified staff that are under quarantine. And that's an important part because uh, our teaching staff in particular if we have too many of them who are in quarantine, it's going to become very difficult to remain open. And I'll come back to that point. But that's 2.3% of all of our certified staff. So, and that's a rolling list of numbers. We get quarantined typically for 14 days and people come off the list, go on the list. And the goal is to try to keep as 
as many of our certified staff able to be in the building. We're also having about average of one case per day. Um, so that's why people get an email from me just about every day about a case in, in our buildings. One thing that's really important to note is that I do expect our colleagues from around the state to be making different decisions based on their very specific local information that's occurring. So it would be, I think, a mistake to look at other towns and say, well, they just did that, we need to do that. For whichever way, whether they're opening up further or closing down further, I think what we need to make sure we keep doing is paying attention to our local data. And the two most important things that we're gonna to continue to look at is the, the number of cases in each of our buildings and our ability to contact trace and make sure that we're able to pull out the students who would be in close contact and make sure we can continue to work on it. That's one. If we can keep up with the contact tracing, that's a, an important element. The other piece is what I mentioned to before. We need to make sure we're paying attention to how much staff we have in our building. Currently, we have 14 quarantine. We can work with that. It's not easy. Um, we obviously have a number of subs, not just for certified teachers, but even for paras and, and those other positions. Uh, but as long as those two pieces are manageable, we're going to continue to stay the course. Currently, there's no attempt to try to open up 6 through 8 or 9 through 12 any further. We're not going to try to bring kids back at those grade levels uh, at this time, given where we are. Um, another thing that we're going to be changing is that uh, it's not really a major change, but it happened, in fact, last night we sometimes become aware of a case late in the evening. And when that happens, there's not enough time to actually do the contact tracing in, uh, with fidelity. So last night we had to make the decision that we would close Trumbull High School today because we just didn't have enough time to do the contact tracing, which means we wouldn't have been able to identify the kids or staff that couldn't be there. And, and that we don't want to get into that situation. So. You may see us close a school for a day sometimes in order to make that contact tracing. One thing that I will do next time, because of the lateness of the phone call, there was a, a, a handful of people who weren't aware. So I will also follow up with a phone call. So they'll get an email, they'll get a text, and they'll get a phone call so that we, we're doing our best to, to communicate with people um, as we move forward with that. Um, and again, we may need to close our, our A school or our district if we run into a staff issue. So we may run into uh, a few days where we know we're just not gonna have enough staff to leave a particular building open. We may need to make the decision to close that school and do remote learning for those few days if, if that's the case. Uh, I certainly know of plenty of schools in this state who've had to close for two weeks. In fact, we were required to do that early on in the process when we had to close Hillcrest for two weeks, and that was because we didn't have enough staff to, to make it safe. So we'll continue to go day by day um, as we make our decisions. Uh, no one is trying to, uh, to make any decisions uh, that are overly courageous, but we want to look at our local health data, our local situation, and that's when the governor gave superintendents the responsibility to make these decisions is because we can look at the exact situation that's happening here in Trumbull versus what might be happening in a town that's many, many, many miles away from us. Um, a couple other pieces of this. Um, one other thing that one other thing, actually two other things that we've done, uh, teachers were requesting some additional teacher shields, K-5. They wanted an opportunity to have an additional barrier. So when they're working with children, perhaps a little bit closer one-on-one -on -one to be able to provide feedback. So we use part of our coronavirus relief funds in order to buy every uh, K-5 teacher one of those shields. They, they have all those. I received a recent request through my reopening advisory committee to purchase uh, 2,500 student shields. So these are those uh, dividers that actually sit on every child's desk. So we are expecting 2,500 of those desk shields 
uh, in the next week or so. I was told it could be as early as this Friday. It may be a little bit longer because sometimes that occurs. Um, given the fact that we're not planning at this point to go full and in-person at the middle school or high school, we are not purchasing those because they have much more distance between the students at the middle school and the high school at this time. Um, and then if people need to know, parents especially, that we may need to uh, pull back. We may need to take our K-5 classes and we may need to go back to a hybrid model. You're gonna see some, di some districts uh, maybe even taking the decision to just close school. And I have to respect every superintendent's decision to do that because again, they know what specifically is happening in their particular district. But parents need to know that here in Trumbull, if we start getting too many cases all on one particular day, uh, we may need to close for a short period of time, and we may also make the decision that we need to scale back to hybrid. At this time, we're going day by day, week by week, and we're going to continue with our, our status quo. But I think parents, I'm sure they're thinking of this, but they need to know that things can change. And as we get more into the winter season, things likely will change. So those, that's the updates that I have around, around reopening, and I hope hope um, that clarifies some of the information that some people have asked me about. Okay, thank you very much. Madam Chair? Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? Certainly. Um, Dr. Selma, I guess the, the one question I have is, um, are we seeing any spread in the schools? Because the way it seems to me right now, uh, um, as a parent and as a board of ed member, I get these emails and it, like tonight we got one, a case at Hillcrest, a uh, case at Trumbull High, a case of, it seems like there's a case in all the different schools. Are there multiple cases in any of these schools? Are you seeing any spread? That's my one question. So there, there certainly has been multiple cases in our schools, but not from the spread, you know, not from a spread from a positive case. At least that's that's been our uh, situation so far. So we haven't had um, a number of positive cases that lead to other positive cases in the same building. But uh, Hillcrest has had a few cases, Madison has had a few cases, Trumbull High School has had a few cases. So yes, there's been multiple cases, but there hasn't been any indication of spread. I talked to our Director of Nursing, Lynn Steinbrick, at least daily, probably five to 10 times daily, um, and she is also directly connected to our Department of Public Health person in, in Trumbull, Lucy Vango, and they talk often as well. And there's been no indication of any spread within our building, but that's something we want to continue to pay attention to. So like I said, we have, I think we'll continue to see this daily email from me, never know which school might have that case pop up. And uh, if it becomes too much, then we'll have to, to rethink our, our position. Thank you. Thank you, I have a question. Mr. Ward? Uh, last time I mentioned transportation. Any difficulties with the buses or pick up and drop off at the schools? The, there's more students on the bus at this time. We're still following all the guidelines in terms of buses. One thing that has come up from elementary principals in particular is uh, it's a little bit more challenging to contact trace on the bus. And so we've actually purchased stickers for all the buses so we can label every bus seat. And that way our principals can work to make sure they know where our children are sitting specifically on the bus. So those should be actually installed, I would say. When I say installed, I mean it's a sticker. So yeah, you put them on the, on the seat. But those should be put up next week because we've had some trouble. Sometimes our little guys are, are pretty short. We can't even see them on the videotape. We gather the videotape to try to do our contact tracing. Uh, so know that it's, it's continued to be um, working fairly well. We haven't seen any spread on our bus either. But again, we're, we, to add one more piece, you guys know I listened to my weekly seminar, uh, webinar with the Department of Public Health and now they're really focusing on the fact that mask wearing is the primary thing we need to do. In fact, they brought up ventilation because ventilation is coming up as the winter weather gets colder. They're saying, listen, you do wanna to try to provide some fresh air into the room, but 
even as you're decreasing the amount of air into the, the fresh air into the room, it's so important you have people wearing their masks. And I got to tell you, our, our kids, our staff have been absolutely terrific around mask wearing. And so we want to just make sure we, we continue to push that particular mitigation strategy, plus all the other ones, because they all are uh, additive mitigation strategies. Here's uh, my second question about contact tracing. Uh, the procedure, who is responsible for making all this information available to parents from the child to the child? How is the procedure on that? Could you explain to me the, what happened? Sure. That's kind of a there's kind of a long answer to that. Well, it's a short. Why do I do? Okay. So who's the actually the responsible person or people I guess they have to do this? Myself, the principals. That's the short answer. In other words, you're responsible for contact tracing of yep. all the pupils that come down with. Correct. How much time is that taking? It's taking an inordinate amount of time. That's what I want to bring up. The fact is that we haven't really decided, not decided, but we should take a look at that, Madam Chair. There must be some other way without putting some pressure on you and your department to do all this work on contact tracing. I doubt the park is not involved in this. I've, I've asked about this, and the Department of Public Health in Trumbull is not staffed in order to. They're order not staffed. To this. So, yeah, we brought it up with uh, the Commissioner Cardona. We brought it up at the, at the State Department of Public Health. They know that uh, districts are doing their best to do this, but a lot of the work really comes down to um, principals notifying me, working with Lynn Steinbrick, who is the director of nursing. She does a tremendous amount of work herself on this, making sure we know exactly which dates we're supposed to be looking at in terms of when a positive case could have been infectious and then in our buildings. And then Christina Heffley, who's on our administrative team, has been instrumental in developing queries. So we do a lot of infinite campus queries to be able to develop the groups of students who have identified as close contacts so I can send out group emails. So those group emails do in fact come from me. And uh, sometimes when I send them out, like today, I, I sent out something and there was actually a, a little error in what I did and you know it, it happened. And so I had to send out a couple of uh, mea culpas to try to, to try to straighten things out. So it's- Well, do you want the superintendent or this is something statewide? This is pretty statewide. So responsibilities, every superintendent must do what you're doing, right? I don't know how every superintendent is doing this, but they delegate that to a different person on the personnel, I guess. Some are able to, yep. But a lot of these come through the superintendent and um, their superintendents are dealing with it. It's all for a time, but yeah. Well, they have to, because they're here. I understand that, but there must be some other way to the legal is also all the HIPAA, there's all the HIPAA pieces too. So everything is very confidential. So there's HIPAA right. pieces. One of the things that when you look at the state, they say how many contact tracers the state has. I never have been offered any assistance from the state to give us some contact tracers. Uh, maybe I can reach out to our governor and say, can we borrow some of those contact tracers because we kind of need to run our schools too. But the contact, the principal tells you these are the students. You have to notify, is that how you do it? Yep. The principals are very involved with this. They're very busy with doing this. They're, they thank their lucky stars when they don't have a day, but it seems like every day one of them is contacting me. So there's there's always seems to be a day where we're sending out a message from a school. But it's a big burden for the superintendent, plus we're on the system they're sending out. The last question I have was on the lunchroom yeah. program, any Changes or still eating in the classroom, elementary? Elementary is still eating in the classroom. I think some of the principals have explored what they could do in the in their cafeterias. I don't know of any yet who have moved there, but you couldn't quote me on that just in I, you know, thought, you know. Yeah, but the middle schools have, have gone into the, the cafeterias, the high schools have been using the cafeteria. And like I said before, every table and every seat at the middle school and high school is, is labeled and numbered to make the contact tracing process more efficient. Thank you, Madam. Okay. 
All right, we're going to move on. Our next item is when school start time update. Dr. Body committee members, please. This is our presentation uh, of our final work on the later school start time committee that the board asked us to uh, begin in uh, July 2020. And uh, board members here in the room have a packet, but uh, Michelle is projecting this for everybody in the public this evening. And so, briefly on the background, I should say that I will be joined uh, by three members of our committee, although the cover sheet indicates that uh, here are two. Grant will be with us tonight. She actually has dealt with book for an athletic uh, event or a banquet tonight, so she expresses her regret. But uh, the background to this committee uh, is shown on the second slide, which is, as you know, that in February 2019, because this topic has a fairly long history by board standards, uh, there was a presentation by consultant Jonathan Costa uh, to this board or a previous version of this board about some exploratory work that was done by a prior committee. Uh, I was not on that prior committee. Many of you were on the board at the time and uh, Mr. Costa had done some consultant work with that committee. Uh, we fast forward at least for purposes of this slide to March 2020 and Dr. Raskin came as I'm sure you'll remember to this board and uh, presented research related to uh, scientific benefits of later school start time. Fast forward that a little bit to July. Uh, we were in this room exactly this way at this time, and uh, the board established a committee and asked that we come back with a final report uh, in November 2020. So that's what we're doing this evening. And uh, I want to say, if you follow some of the research over the past few months, there's actually continuing research on the topic of later sleep times, uh, even during the COVID-19 pandemic. And what does the influence of that show? What does it reveal? So uh, the topic still is a pertinent one. And that brings us to the committee charge. And I've come back to this a few times. What, what you unanimously asked us to do back in July was this to determine what implementation of later school start times would look like and require in trouble. And back in July 2020, you asked us to assume for purposes of this committee that there was benefit to the scientific uh, data behind later school start time. But what seemed to not really be clear at that point from the 2019 all the way back to 2018 and 2020 work was exactly what it would look like and require in trouble. So that was the charge of the committee. It's not my committee. It's uh, the board's committee. It's the town's committee. It's the committee that was charged to be representative. And so what you'll see tonight, I am really proud to say, is, is the good work of that committee. And uh, the next slide represents those members of the committee. I, I want to dignify all of them. If we were in a different place in terms of COVID, we might have all of them presenting in some form. But I do want to say, and this gets to the next slide, please, Michelle. Um, the committee and the process, I would suggest, is some model for the board about strong committee work. It certainly, in my judgment, would be an improvement over uh, the prior committee from 2018, 2019, which the board uh, at least some members of the board had concerns about. But as we promised back in July, this committee has been transparent. There is a section of our website devoted to the agendas, minutes, and recordings of our meetings. Uh, we've had five total meetings, and we had a discernment process that I'll describe in a moment that has moved toward tonight's presentation. So <clears throat> what you see tonight is the result of consensus among the committee. And uh, various members of the group who are here with me tonight will speak about that. Um, if you go to the next slide, Michelle, uh, we asked the committee on the very uh, last meeting to um, reach some consensus about key things that they might want to bring to you. What are some key things that have kind of undergirded all the work? And these are two that were mentioned many times by the committee members. 
First of all, all the presented options of this committee will affect students, parents, teachers, and after school programs. The goal is to find the best solution that will impact our children in a positive manner. And I should say, one might say the best solution is the current solution. That you might say doing nothing at all is the best solution. But we have some options that we'll present. And then another thing that was appealing to many people on the committee was the second one you see here. Change is hard at first, then people adapt, and in time it becomes common practice. So with that, I'm going to move to the next part of our presentation, which you might say are some key factors that relate to most or even all options for later school start time. And to review these slides will be Sarah Scrafani, who's representing our teachers tonight. And I think many of you know Sarah's an outstanding technology integration specialist for Trumbull High School. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. So these are some key factors that are that really um, weave their way through every single one of the conversations and the options that we have. Thank you. So first, there is student transportation. So as, as you know, uh, bus transportation is required by stat state statute for all of our students. The way that our our student transportation works is that we have um, bus tiers and a tier is one level of bus service. So currently the Public Public School has two tiers that are based on the secondary run, which is from 7.30 a.m. and then to 2.30 p.m. And then the elementary, which is 8.35 a.m., 3.20 p.m. So there's a 50 minute minimum needed between the bus tiers. So that means that when one bus run ends, we need 50 minutes in between to start the next bus run. So as we were thinking about every option that will be presented to you, any change in the start or end times must really meet the transportation parameters for being able to pick up every student. So then the next key factor, key factor would be our special student population. We have two of those that come to mind right away, and that is aquaculture. That's our aquaculture program for the high school students. Currently, there's 149 students for part of that program. They will leave Trumbull High at approximately noon and on Monday through Friday to participate over at the aquaculture school. We also have RCA, which is the Regional Center for the Arts. And currently we have 23 students who leave Trumbull High at approximately 145 Monday through Thursday. So as we think about whatever options or keeping what we have now, to what extent will a change in the, in the PHS start and then time impact these populations, these special students? Where's that ag agri-science in there? Um, agri-science actually is, is currently part of our current, it's part of our current um, student population. So any start and end times would be worked into the current Trumbull High School schedule. So there wouldn't be as many, um, so the start and end time change, while they are a special student population, they, they would not be um, necessarily transportation impact. Okay. So does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um oh sorry I forgot where I was. At, oh so the key factors are athletics. So now we're up to athletics. Um athletics has about a thousand and fifty students and approximately fifteen hundred different spots. So that means that sometimes you have someone who is a pre season athlete so they would obviously would be participating more of the year. Uh, games typically begin at four o'clock. Although when I talked to my team about this, he reminded me that there are some there are some sports that just start earlier, like for example, golf um, needs to be played you know earlier in the afternoon. So that um, and that um, varsity football games are generally held in the evenings under the lights. So, but that's their typical schedule is that games generally begin around four p.m. And then some other FCX schools with later than usual high school dismissals are Greenwich and Wilton. So we talked about looking at what they do. 
And then our key question here would be to what extent will a change in the THS end time impact these students? So it's really not what happens at the beginning of the day, it really is what happens at the end. Does anybody have any questions about that? Um, and then lastly, our last key factor that weaves its way through all of the all of the things that we talked about would be the length of the day versus the instructional hours. So the length of the day is the time from the first bell to the last bell. So currently, Trumbull High School is third in the length of day of 153 Connecticut high schools. For instructional hours, that's the time spent actually in in class learning. So this subtracts the time for passing, homeroom, lunch. So currently Trumbull High School is 65th of 153 Connecticut high schools. So another question to consider is to what extent will a change in the length of day impact the instructional hours in your school? All right. And so those are that leads us to our next step of the main implementation options. So does anybody have any other um, other questions about any of those key factors? All right, I'll turn it right back over to Dr. Barty. Yes. Instructional hours, am I right, Marty? 900? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's, are we over the 900? We are over the 900. We've been over the 900 for a long time. There's not many schools that are over the 900 hours. They all you did find that out, right? They're all over. They're all over. They're all just 900 is the minimum. 900 is the minimum. Yeah, but we're, we're, we have a little more than that. I think Trumbull High School had that. The last report that I did when I was there, we had more instructional time than other high schools. Yeah, 60, 60, 60, the 65, the mm -hmm. 65th out of the 153 okay. high schools. Just wanted to make sure you knew that. Okay. And if you are interested, we do have the breakdown of all the, you know, of all the different schools and how many instructional minutes and the length of day for all the schools. Mm -hmm. um, in okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. So I'm the, I'm the transitional slide here because this slide the board saw when I gave um, an update report in October. And this will guide most of the rest of the presentation. So there's an infinite technically number of ways that you could modify the times. But basically, they fall into these four groups, which is how we'll structure the rest of tonight. Uh, the first option is that we could keep the two tier bus structure and times, but swap elementary and secondary. The second, we could keep the two tier bus structure, but move all start times later. The third, keep the two tier bus structure, but move the high school times alone to align with the elementary times. And the fourth, we could add a third tier to the bus structure and have three different sets of start and end times. And because we talked about, or I talked about these options with you in October as the current status of the committee, that's how we're going to structure it tonight. But we're going to start uh, with Rob Martini, one of our parents on the committee, speaking about options three and four, and then we'll be moving to options one and two. And I'll give away a little bit of the surprise before Rob comes up. Um, the committee would have a consensus that options three and four are relatively unfeasible for Trumbull at this particular time, or perhaps at any time, but compared to options one and two. And we'll talk more about that at the end, but we're going to start with three and four because we're going to get the options that are least feasible out of the way early. I'm very pleased to have Rob Martini, who's a parent of some children in the district here this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bud. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, our option three, keep the two tier bus structure that moves from high school time to align with elementary time. So the middle schools would be 730 to 230, Trumbull High 835 to 320, and elementary schools from 835 to 320. Um, to Dr. Bud's point, um, the, the highlight here would be that it would focus primarily on the high school, right? Um, and so that would be the, uh, the health benefits criteria for grades 9 through 12. And we did work this thread for a bit simply because it is logistically simple compared to some of the others. You have to consider uh, variables outside of the high school. 
uh, because they don't understand the liquidity impact there. But on the alternate side, there was a high transportation cost for us, roughly two million dollars for I think 21 additional buses. It had to uh, hire 30 new drivers, which cost money and logistically difficult to cut it down. Um, and probably most importantly, grades six through eight would be left out of the solution. If you harken back to the um, presentation about health benefits, um, the sixth grade through eighth grade are definitely in that, that group that um, that uh, you know you want to try to get them the additional physics while they would also benefit from the uh, the physiological uh, benefits of the extra sleep. Uh, then we look at option four. And here, the middle schools would uh, switch from uh, to 7:20 in the morning to 2:20 in the afternoon. Trouble high from 8:15 to 8:50. And the elementary schools from 9:05 to 3:50. And again, that's the third tier. That's uh, the bus structure with two different sets of times. Um, again, on the positive side of the ledger here, this meets the articulated health needs for grades 9 through 12. There's also a transportation cost associated with it. It's much less than the other. It's only about $400,000. And that would be tied to extended hours for the bus drivers, as opposed to extra buses or four more buses. Uh, but in this, in this uh, scenario, uh, grade six through eight, they would actually have an earlier start time. So not only do they not take advantage of the benefits that they would hope for in terms of the earlier start time, we'd actually be going in the wrong direction. So it's a bit of a non-starter. Um, and then, of course, you know, an earlier um, or later uh, day for elementary students could could potentially have for some families a, a negative impact. So for those reasons, and really thought about it on balance, and given the fact that there are other options that negate the cost problem, you know, potentially cost uh, negligible or very low cost, and the fact that there are other benefits, other options. But we didn't have to make those trade-offs for certain students. We just felt that it's very important to focus on uh, a couple other approaches. But we did look at these uh, pretty heavily. I, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, Senior Martini. So in all four of these options, um, K through two is grouped in with K through five. So whatever you did with K through five, they would all be going at the same time currently. Agree. All, I, mean, I don't think we stratified it uh, with all four of these. Yeah, right. So my 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 issue with that is uh, I actually I have later school start times in the world. And many people know that and how the schedule is currently. And we have a different setup here where we our schools are K through two, and then we have three through five schools. Um, our times are drastically different. Our start times, and as far as I know, studies show show that K through two students. Um, also need to start school later. They can't be on the, the very early schedule. There are latest schools in the world. They start the latest. They start later than high school. I believe they're like nine o'clock start time. That's what I think is, is listed. So um, I have we talked about that group because they really should be, at least from what I know, they shouldn't be grouped in with the K the K and five um, kids. I teach fifth grade, and we're the earliest fifth grade. We're at seven twenty. And then the KP2 is more like nine o'clock, it's like a two hour difference. So I'm just wondering if we've explored that at all in any of these options because I don't, I don't really see that. Yeah, and, you know, uh, my experience with the discussion, the, the closest we came to that particular stratification was some discussion around the logistics of the bus schedule themselves. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of discussion about what about kids in the dark, starting earlier, the younger kids. And there appear to be a couple different ways that you could approach the schedules with the buses to bump up at least some of the uh, start times. You know, when they would actually get picked up, right? Start time would be different, but the bus schedule would be different. As you know, some of these kids are on the bus for a long time in the morning. So if you can shorten some of those routes through, you know, working with just this, you might be able to solve for some of that. But I don't think, and I'll defer to you guys, but I don't think we particularly looked at K through two as its own group and could be worked out. So I mean, because you say because we have that brief right now, right, with COVID and, and, and everything that we, you know, we, we've broken them off K through two, you know, different with the, the hybrid method and not the hybrid method, and they were our first learners back. So we have we have some experience with breaking that group, even though those groups are all the same school. 
but I think it's something that we really need to look at um, because, again, we've been doing it for almost 20 years in Wilton, and I know that that really young group cannot be grouped in with the fifth graders who are rarely to go at 720 in the morning, and kindergartners are not rarely to go at 720 in the morning. So I, I, I just have a real concern with that, with that, and I, and I hope that we can wrap that into, um, you know, further, further uh, discussion and further options. Because I just don't see it here, and I feel like we're leaving that group out a little bit. Okay. So I know we discussed in the town for other reasons, for budget reasons, on breaking up the K2 and then bring the regular force. And I'm not sure how you do it. Look, the, the big problem that we have, the pushback was parents tend to be very preferred to when their kids are young. So the, when you take two schools like Jane Ryan and Cashel, they Cashel became the K to two school, Jane Ryan became the three to four. Well, there was a lot of pushback. But Jane Ryan parents wanted to stay at Jane Ryan. That's the parents wanted to stay at Cashel. If you were able to do it in one school, I don't know if that's what you do it, that's different. We had actually looked at it, you know, one school would be K to two, the other school would be K three and four. At the time, maybe parents would change because that maybe we liked and we went out the board. We will get it more for budget. There was a lot of pushback. I don't know. I don't know how you do it. We're a much smaller. I have a question. It says low transportation cost. What is that cost? What size? The action more. It says low. What is low? So we haven't presented that one yet, but Brian Rickard is here to talk about options one and two. Good evening, everybody. Um, so I'll go through these options uh, relatively quickly because I know you have a lot of questions. But option one would keep the current two tier bus pile that we already have in place, but we would swap the times for elementary and secondary. So you have some elementary schools starting at 7 30 and going to 2 30, and then you have uh, grade six to 12 going from 8 35 to 20. Um, some considerations with that, uh, that time would meet the uh, health uh, target that you're trying to get for those secondary students that um, the professional presented on way back in March. Um, and there would be a relatively low uh, transportation cost. Uh, Dr. Bud, I don't know that number off the top of my head, but I believe it was um, considerably low, especially compared to the other options. Um, other considerations to consider there are that uh, there would be child care impacts for families that have elementary students. I don't want to speculate that those would be positive or negative, but there's no way around it there would be impacts to child care. Um, also, some bus routes for elementary students uh, would start in the darkness depending on the time of year that they're being picked up. Uh, option two, again, keeping the two-tier bus structure, but we would move all star towns later. So the secondary schools, grades six through 12, would start at 8 a.m. go to 2 30. And those um, that school day is roughly a half an hour shorter for both secondary schools than we currently have. And then elementary would go from 8 50 to 3 55. Uh, so secondary would start 30 minutes later, elementary would start 15 minutes later on that model. And then just a couple of considerations there. Again, does it meet that target uh, that we're trying to hit having students at the secondary level? start school uh, later than we currently do. And again, that would be uh, relatively low transportation cost compared to the other models. Again, I don't have a specific number, um, but I'm sure John can get that for us. And that was um, number two, correct? That's option two. Yep. And then again, uh, there would be um, internal schedules that we'd have to look at at the secondary level for the middle and high school. Um, again, don't want to speculate on positive or negative or uh, how much instructional time could potentially be lost. But if we're starting the day a half an hour uh, later and ending it at the same time, we would have to look at the bell schedules for the middle and high school. Um, and then potential uh, contraction implications of various employee groups. Again, um, with it starting a half hour later and ending at the same time, we want to make sure that we don't create other issues uh, or have unintended consequences uh, for that model. Right, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> I don't see how it would be an internal scheduling issue because at the high school you have a 45 minute lunch. That should get cut down to 28 minutes. And now and those other minutes go to instructional time. 
So that's not, an, I don't think that would be an issue once you look at a schedule. And I'm sure that people in the high school have looked at schedules before. Is that correct? Certainly not an insurmountable task, but we, we wouldn't be able to use the same bell schedule at middle school or high school. They would have to change. But you're right. Well, you there are opportunities to, to try to say, like, hey, right. instead of a 45 minute lunch, we do that differently. Right. Yeah. Because that, that, I think we're the only school district that has a 45 minute lunch at the high school level. So I don't think you know you need that many minutes for that. But that's something that you, you have to look at and you know, what they would have to discuss. As far as the administration would have to look at that and see what they and can do. The level. And um, can you explain a little bit to me the contractual implications, please? Yeah, so again, don't want to speculate on um, what that can mean, but as of right now, I'll speak to the middle school uh, teachers with school starting at 7 35. Um, they are 15 minutes early, so they you know, come through the door at 7 20, school ends at 2 30. Um, contractually, uh, the earliest day is 2.45, so by shortening the day, we don't want to create a uh, different issue in terms of how long that they're in the building. Is that, is that fair, Dr. Buck? Yes, awesome. I would say there are also implications for non-certificated groups uh, in, both in that option where hours of school would change because we have non-certificated groups such as paraeducators who are paid that buy-up based on service hours with students. So if the length of the student day were to change, there's a potential contractual implication for that group. Uh, that's a good question. We keep on saying low transportation costs. The cost is not going to change that we have right now. Two tiers, right? Uh, with options one and two, the reason that there is potentially some uh, and it's low uh, transportation costs is because we have some of the transportation costs in our budget is for special education transportation. And right now, um, we have a fixed budget for transportation that takes that into account. If we would change our start times, there's a potential additional cost for some of the special education transportation. And, and that's going to come out a little bit in a second in terms of what I might suggest, what the committee might suggest could be the next steps to consider. But we want to be, we want to be clear, although options three and four were transportation costs, Options three and four are expensive. Options one and two for a bus transportation cost are not zero. There's probably some cost. There. But it's the same now, right? We have two tier system. <coughs> what is going to change? Did I miss something? Well, some of our students who have transportation to specialized schools that are not uh, in our 10 schools, those schools aren't necessarily going to change their times. So there's a potential additional cost for some of those students. At least based on this Perkins analysis, which I, I would rely on for sure at the moment. But we have a two tier system now. Correct. I mean, when it's like it goes out to two, it's a two tier system. That's right. Why would you lower the cost to be Well, option two, the, the, the reason there is some additional cost on option two is the same reason that there's some additional cost for option one. While you, while let's say in option two, you would have all of our typical students attending secondary 8 to 230 in this example, all of the elementary 850 to 335, you could have more specialized transportation vehicles needed to run students at other times based on when those specialized schools operate. Yeah, but isn't that normal? We do that anyway. Sure, I'm not I'm not going to second guess here what our transportation manager says about that. I would like, I mean, that's what we do now. Yeah, we do it now, folks. We have two tiers, so. We have two tiers, and we do have special, um, we do have special transportation for different But schools. Lucinda, this may increase the number because every school that we would be sending people to would be on the schedule that matches our schedule now. If they have that schedule and we have a different schedule, we'll have to spend a little more money to get our kids to the special program because they have the right to go to that special program. That would be, yep, I, I understand. And that would be the same thing with the uh, students coming in at AgriScience because right. the bus is coming at different times from different uh, cities, so towns. So that would be another issue if we started at different times and they started at different times, where there's going to be a bus issue with sending people. Isn't that correct? Potentially. Yeah, okay. That's why I asked about the accident before. I, I understand what you're saying. Thank you. So our committee's consensus would be these five proposed next steps for the board for the board to consider. 
Um, our group, I think, as I said before, has been a really productive model of the democratic process. Um, we had a consensus that we would ask you to continue uh, uh, the committee's work, but to allow, and this I think supports what I heard at least Mr. Gallo speaking about, uh, taking options three and four potentially off the table because for one, they're very expensive in terms of bus transportation at a time when the district, um, uh, to put it simply, has some financial challenges. But narrowing the focus on options one and two, and there are some nuances of one and two related to what you brought up, K2 versus 3-5, really digging down into the transportation details. And also this last point of that first book, situating the work in larger wellness conversations with things. For example, there was some concern by some student members of our committee that if activities and homework after school continue to be the same length of duration, would that offset potential health benefits uh, uh, that we would try to be getting with later school start time? But, but some people say, well, will students just stay up an hour later? So if there's a sense of some committee members that we don't want to totally study this in isolation, but understand some related things. Uh, the second point here is really we would think that if the board wanted to continue to investigate options one and two, there's some need for a family survey. So we can speculate here, or committee members can speculate, okay, is 7.20 too early, uh, 6.45, 7 o'clock too early for a parent to want their elementary school student waiting for a bus? But by the same token, there were committee members who felt, and we've heard here sometimes, that uh, parents might be willing to, to take that. So uh, some kind of survey of where our community actually is on that could potentially be helpful. Uh, third, the committee felt that um, just as you brought up some additional factors tonight, we would need to investigate options one and two more in terms of specific about those student special populations and athletics, as well as some related but really essential pieces of the Trumbull public schools experience, such as TLC, and also in terms of traffic and the traffic patterns around the town. And, and at some point I go back to when we have so many options on the table, we can't study everything in sufficient depth. So taking options three and four off the table, we would recommend would allow a slightly narrower focus to study. Finally, uh, or, or next to last, as Brian already mentioned, um, there are details of what those internal schedules would look like, the shifts that would have to be made for option two for both middle school and high school. And the board would have to be more informed about that. And then finally, uh, there are districts, Connecticut districts are the most reasonable to study. Um, Wilton is one. Uh, there are others, both in Fairfield County and around the state, who have implemented this. Some have implemented it recently and have learned um, through some mistakes, what to do and what not to do. Others have implemented it a while ago. But we had a great dialogue through all of our meetings, as well as this past one. And certainly, I can speak for everybody who attended that last meeting, who uh, felt that if the board wanted to, uh, wanted to have this group continue to drill down into options one and two, they would be interested in being your representatives in doing that. If the board's wish was to say thank you, you've done the task we asked you to do, we're, we're, we're happy uh, not to have you do any more with it, we'll be fine with that too. But we've accomplished the charge you asked of us. I appreciate personally and professionally you're allowing me to chair the group, and I do think it has uh, been a more transparent process than the board has had in the past at this particular time. So thank you. Okay, so based on what you said, you, you touched upon you touched upon different topics, and I think that's making everyone uh, think a little bit. But I think that you do need to look at further at other things. Uh, after school job, our our students don't have disposable income; they do go and they do work. And how do their jobs affect this? And then we have our faculty who live in different towns and maybe their children are attending schools at different times. We, we look at that. So there's other issues that you need to look at to decide what's the best all, all around. And you would really need to, I don't know, have you spoken to the faculty? Have the faculty put any 
for the faculty survey. We, we were not uh, we were not able or probably uh, willing to do that prior to November and coming back to you and asking you what your interest okay. is. If this board were to say continue and we want one of certainly a family survey is a non-starter uh, in terms of the set, there's no brainer, I should say, not a non-starter. It must be the opposite, must be done. Certainly a faculty survey is another one. Traffic studies we talked about, but that all depends on whether the board wants us to keep working or not. Certainly Lucinda, I'm could I ask a question, sorry. Lucinda? One minute, Mrs. Noystal, he's still speaking. I, I would, I'm sorry, Mr. Sal, I was just saying, I think it would be irresponsible to get tons of surveys out there before coming back to you all saying, this is where we are, what do you think? Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Mrs. Noystal. Uh, what I wanted to know, Lucinda, do you as board chair or Jonathan as chair of this committee want a motion to have the committee go and do those next steps? If if the board so wants it, make it a you know a recommendation and do it as an com as an. Well, I'd like the opportunity. I personally to believe they do more. need to do that, but if uh, I would like somebody to make a motion if they want to. Scott, do you want to make a motion? No, I'd actually like to continue discussion for a couple of minutes before okay. we do that because it might change what the motion would be. But. Um, well, if uh, one thing I want to say just right right at the start so I don't miss the opportunity later, um, Dr. Budd is to thank you for your leadership on the committee and and all the members. I uh, attended a couple of the sessions and watched the videos and um, you know it really was terrific work. so so thank you for that. Um, one thing I just I do want to go on the record to say I want to be careful not to, um, write off any options, you know, based on, you know, one particular factor. So for instance, um, option four, uh, I, I frankly wouldn't, you know, I personally wouldn't, wouldn't think twice about maybe spending $400,000 to get the benefits uh, for our students in terms of their health and their academic uh, potential. Um, that's that's a price I think is is in the realm of uh, a good value, um, but it, on that option, it, what the what the showstopper for me is the idea of having the the middle schoolers go earlier, right? So before we just write off option four or any of them, I think there may be components of each that you might want to you know either reincorporate, right? Like maybe a three tier, but arranged differently would would work. Um, so that's just one one piece of feedback um, on that. And then the other big one for me is the elephant in the corner of the room. And I'm I I don't want to blow up your presentation bringing this up, but something has to be done about the high school schedule to begin with, right? Like going, we I thought we heard a presentation much earlier in the year that we need to move to an eight period day, and and shouldn't that be part of this work? Yes, um, the brief answer to that would be, and I think you're referring to the presentation Mr. Garino gave in uh, November 20, uh, 2019. Right. The Agri Science Building, a board presentation, the Agri Science Building. That was about possible changes to the high school schedule. Right. And, uh, I think, in reference to your point, Scott, we would say option two would <coughs> almost certainly require that. Um, that could be done with any of the options. It could actually be done right now, as a matter of well, not right now, but it could, right. be, and it could be done at the current start time. However, option two, as currently written, moves the start time of the high school day, but not the end time. So that probably requires uh, looking at exactly what Mrs. Simpanelli talked about, things like the length of the lunch period and things like that. It would have to be done for option two, but it could be done for all sorts of options. What I really like about that option is that um, it allows for the younger ones. We, we, we keep saying, you know, we keep forgetting about the, the kindergartners and the, and the first graders. It allows them to also go later to school rather than have that the early group, which they should not be. They, they absolutely should not be. Okay. Does anyone else have a comment before I ask? I, I do believe that you do need to move forward, um, Dr. Bud. I think that would be a good idea. 
just to find out, you know, you need some specificity on different things, different areas, things that everyone here has brought up. And my, that might be a good idea. Just quick, so, quickly, I agree in this thing. What happens if we all start at the same time? Did I just start? If, if all schools start at the same time? Well, like later, later time, yeah. Well, that would be most similar to if, if all schools just have a later time. That would be similar to option two. Three. Uh, yes, it's also option three. There's a couple of options that relate. That's possible. Uh, two, two is lower cost than three. Three is very cost. So we could open up all schools and say, look, the main time is about 8.30, right? Right. That's right. I, I think just for clarity on the record, if people, if, and I'm not sure this is exactly what you meant, but if all schools in town were starting at 8.30, right. K-12, that would be a very expensive option. That's actually none of these four, because that would require many more buses. Than what we have. Okay. But can I ask another question? Okay, Madam Chair, I would like to make a motion. Um, and Scott, we can have more discussion, but let me see if I can make this motion. And certainly we can have a lot of discussion around it. Um, so I would like to make a motion that this committee who has done, by the way, a fantastic job. And thank you for your presentation and your dedication to this cause. Um, I think it's an admirable one. I'd like to make a motion for the committee to continue. We certainly still have some questions. We have some things to, to uh, figure out. And it seems like this is the best committee to continue with this work. So I, like, I would like to make a motion for this committee to continue. Do I have a second? And then we can have some discussion. Mrs. Petiti, just a second. Okay. Any uh, discussion? Now, if anyone wants to add anything, but I think that would be a good idea, Dr. Bud. We, we would agree. Okay, you agree. Great. Okay, I will take the vote then. Well, can we go back to asking any other questions or oh, is sure. discussion sure. over? Do you have any other questions on this presentation, you sir? Um, Dr. Bud, regarding like an, an option like option two, I mean, there's nothing sacred about those specific times either, right? Like we, if we, if we wanted to prioritize the secondary schools starting later, you know, like going to eight fifteen or eight thirty, you could move that end time later as well and That's and shift everything by fifteen minutes or so, That's right? True with all the options, I, I wouldn't want anyone to get hung up on say eight forty five versus right because at some point they're placeholders. Um, I think the key thing is how many tiers do we have and which level comes earliest versus latest. Do remember Ms. Scrafani's point that comes from Ms. Perkins. We really have to have 15 minutes minimum between tiers because we have to be able to get the kids dropped off at one school and then move through town to start picking up the next one. So that's the critical piece. But you're right. Uh, with all of these options, frankly, there can be shaving at times. In one right. I mean, uh, my main my main issue is I don't I don't want you know there to be any absolutes in what you know what goes from the pages of your presentation to you know a final recommendation that you there's a lot of as as uh, you know Tim said there's a lot a lot of work still to be done um, and and questions to answer. Uh, but I'm certainly in in support of of your great group continuing the work. Yeah. I think you did a marvelous job. It's an amazing Madam Chair. Thank you. Well, I said, Mr. Martini. Oh, I knew that was coming. That explains it. That explains it. I think that's true. Nearly everyone who comes out. Okay, I'd like to take I'd like to take the vote now for this. Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Yes, yes Mr. Payne. Andy. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I just, you know, what uh, again, I'd like to uh, as well thank Dr. Budd and the committee. Fabulous job. I'm in total support of this continuing. Um, but, you know, my concern, and, and I know Dr. Budd will take care of this with his survey that goes out to the, to the parent community, uh, but I always think of, since it was the situation that I was in, uh, my kids are one in middle school and one in high school, so they're a little older now. But I can think back to the elementary years and, you know, we were a dual working family um, and the impacts that this would have on a dual working family. I don't, I don't want to see any portion of our, our parents put in a situation where they need to spend more money because we're moving times around. And I also think of the single parent 
families that are out there. And I know you'll keep them in mind and I know you're gonna send out your survey um, and hopefully you ask these sort of questions in the survey, uh, you know, financial impacts that this may have uh, on the families, uh, on Trumbull families. So I just wanna thank you for everything you've done. I think you're doing a great job and I look forward to seeing this uh, go on and, and come to uh, some sort of conclusion, but thank you. Thank you, Andy, and you brought up some good points. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to take the vote, Mr. Petiti. Okay, uh, Tim Gallo. I'm in favor. Mike Ward. Yes, in favor. Jackie Norsell. In favor. Scott Kerr. Yes, in favor. Andy Palo. In favor. Lieutenant Timpanelli, in favor. Thank you, unanimous. Thank you, Dr. Bud. Thank you, committee members that came tonight. Thank you very much for all the work you've done. We do appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we're going to move on to our next is the Bridgeport Magnet School Tuition. Mr. Hendrickson. As we discussed in the executive session, this is a settlement agreement where the money changes hands between the districts. We settled a long standing dispute and started ground zero with this year. This year being 2021 for payments for from Trumbull to Bridgeport Magnet Schools and from Bridgeport to then Trumbull's Action Science Facility. Uh, I'd also like to ask you to authorize the uh, superintendent to sign the agreement. Okay. So just to clarify for everyone out there, there was an issue that we had with Bridgeport and how much money that we thought they owed us and they thought we owed them, to put it very simply. And this went on for about four years and it started with Mr. O'Keefe as our business manager and then now it's come to an end. And I think it's come to a good end because it's, it's a flat rate. We don't owe anything and they don't owe anything to us. So we started zero. So I think that's a good thing. So, um, Mr. Hendrickson had asked for a motion. Yes, I can make that motion, Madam Chair. Um, so I'd like to make a motion to approve the authorization of the superintendent um, to authorize the Bridgeport Magnet School Tuition Agreement uh, proposed by Mr. Hendrickson. Second the motion. Mr. Ward seconded. Okay, any discussion? No, okay, all in favor, Mrs. Petini? Mr. Gallo? I'm in favor. Mr. Ward? Yes, in favor. Mrs. Norsell? In favor. Mr. Kim? Yes, in favor. Mr. Palo? I'm going to have to abstain because I, uh, I had middle school parent-teacher conferences earlier tonight and I missed the executive session, so I'm gonna abstain on this. Okay, one abstention, thank you. And listen to Tim Benelli, I agree. Okay, in favor. Okay, we will do that. And uh, Dr. Sybil, you have our approval to move on this. Okay, uh, go ahead, Mr. Hendrickson. Anything else? Uh, not a news topic, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the next topic would be uh, for the board to approve the September 30th, uh, 2020 financial report, which was presented at last, last uh, month's meeting. I failed to ask uh, for board approval, and so we we'll approve that. Okay, Mr. Ward, do you want to make that? I'll make the motion to approve the last month's financial statement for the October 27th, I guess that would be the third week. Yeah, yeah, at the, at the meeting of October 27th. Okay, can I have a second? Mrs. Petiti, just seconds. Okay, any questions on that? You just forgot to, you just forgot to vote on that. Okay, Mrs. Petiti, Mr. Gallo. Yes, I'm in favor. Mr. Ward. Yes, in favor. Okay, Mrs. Norsell. In favor. Mr. Kim? Yes, in favor. And Mr. Palo? In favor. And I'm in favor also. Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, the next topic would the, be the brief award on the two outstanding grants that we have related to COVID. That would be the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund, commonly known as ESSER. We have, were approved and uh, for $127,000 and that was transferred uh, to the school system, and that was used to purchase 536 Lenovo laptops. Uh, the one that we uh, just completed.
included in terms of application uh, was the CRF grant or the coronavirus relief project grant. We applied for five million initially. We got approved for one point uh, two million. Uh, there are three cat uh, excuse me, uh, five categories: personal services, salary, personal services, benefits, other purchase services, supplies, and property. Whereas the ESSER grant was used to fund primarily laptops, which would assist students in, in studying at home. The CRF grant is restricted to bringing those students back. So it is for classroom dedicated services and protective uh, equipment. So things such as sanitizer, additional soap, face masks, disposable well, gloves, face shields, and neck shields, which uh, Superintendent Summer made reference to uh, uh, earlier. Also, in the property line, such things as touchless faucets, uh, gang sinks, and other uh, exhaust fans, air purifiers. Uh, and we have worked closely with uh, the first select woman uh, and kept her and her staff up to date, make sure we are following the appropriate purchasing policies. Uh, however, it has been a moving target initially uh, in that. Uh, 2.1 uh, grant that we, we were approved for, 800,000 was dedicated to transportation. As was commented on earlier in the meeting, virtually uh, nothing is required for transportation. We, we've got that reallocated, and I have a handout. I'll hand out when uh, I finish of the items that we have dedicated the funds for. Uh, it was approved by three levels and it is ready to be funded uh, upon our request through the e-grant system, which is uh, the system that was recently developed for requesting funds. And uh, we have, and also my omission, the funds cover expenditures from March 1st of 2020 to December 30th of this year. That, that required extremely hard work on, the, on behalf of our staff, putting together and coding their purchase of, for proposals as COVID. And Ms. Franzisi is keeping uh, very, uh, very detailed uh, records and uh, almost calling the uh, state hourly to get approval. Give me a minute and then I, I can. Uh, and just to clarify one thing, Mr. Hendrickson, when, when you first spoke, you said 1.2 million, and then later you said 2.1. It is 2.1 million dollars. Just just to clarify for the record. 2.1 million. Yes. Yeah. In the area of salaries, it would be substitute parents and substitute teachers. COVID support liaison, technicians, assistant in technology, uh, benefits for these people, PPS uh, outplacements, and as I said before, surgical masks, uh, gloves, face masks, shields on desks, uh, and various cleaning devices. And uh, we are uh, acquiring 26 two or three gang express touchless laboratory systems, uh, 174 touchless faucets. Uh, we're going to repair the rooftop unit on uh, the PHS auditorium uh, to improve air circulation, purchasing uh, 70 radios and uh, uh, HVAC uh, exhaust fan replacements. And also to go with those gang uh, Touchless laboratory system for installing 26 shutoff valves so we don't have to, sh to shut off water to the entire uh, building uh, should a uh, repair be needed at a later date. And also, there are some minor uh, technology uh, purchases, uh, which include uh, added access points and 
what the key is so we can you know find it. And uh, I'm available to entertain any questions you might have. Thanks, Chair. Go ahead. I'm listening very carefully. Can we get this a future meeting? The financial committee? Do we have a chance to look at this at all? No. But we didn't see that. No, he's, he's presenting it now. I know. So we, we, we were in the process up until really earlier today. Okay. No, I didn't know we're doing that. And I apologize for the. No, for, I like the all report, but I like it. You know, we don't find any in the future. Stuff like this, there's nothing we should have something black and white that I can refer to. That's that's perfectly all right. No, I, <coughs> no, I'd like to, I'd like you, you and all board members to be aware of what we are uh, contemplating with the city and so on. That's correct, that's fine. So that'll be in next month's board meeting, some kind of a yeah, we, we, we can update you, but I can give you a list right now. No, that's right. No, we do have the list right now. What I think that's been interesting about this whole thing is that it's been a moving target throughout the entire process. So originally we were told we were going to get this money, and like Mr. Hendrickson said, eight hundred thousand dollars was going to be for transportation. So we thought that that was going to be money that we'd never be able to spend. But then we were able to get some flexibility a couple of weeks ago. So we started saying, okay, what? How can we use this money to open our school? So. It's been this moving target and making sure that the state would actually approve the items that we were talking about. So Peg has really been going back and forth saying, well, would we get approval for this? Would we get, we don't want to put any money out there that uh, we won't be reimbursed for. And one thing that the Board of Finance, one of the things that the, we're going to do, Paul's going to do a presentation, uh, Peg is going to be present, Peg Rendisi, Rendisi is going to be present, I think. Board Chair Tipinelli will be present as well. We're going to, on Thursday, share with the Board of Finance because they've been very interested too about how we're going to use our CF, CRF funds. They can't tell the Board of Education what to do with the money, but they want to make sure that we're going to get reimbursed with the, the funds that we're getting from the federal government. The, the Board of Finance, understandably, would want to make sure we don't purchase things and then give that to them. So we get the money in our directly, then we get to spend the we pay the bill for the money we get. Yeah, and that doesn't go to the town at all, or I don't know how it works. Well, the most wanted transfer is still in the town. Yeah, it's kind of deposit with the ground. Right, so sometimes with the, with the grant money we get, yeah. like our ECS funds, if, if they all they will often go to the town first because that's where it goes, but then it goes to fund our part of the budget. And the same thing happens with these types of grants. This is obviously a big grant at, at two point one. Town does not approve this. We have we get it and we approve it. That's right. We get it. We spend it. The board of finance is just concerned that we're not we're not buying things. They don't want us to buy things that we don't meet the criteria for being refunded. There's been some concerns around FEMA not um, necessarily refunding everything that maybe they said they were going to refund at the beginning of this process. And so there's a, I think folks are just a little bit gun child say to, to spend funds without seeing the money. It's one of those like show me the money type situations. So Peg's been great trying to get the approval before we actually go ahead and make these purchases. However, there's also rules about the fact when we have to buy these things. So if you had your report tonight, you would buy addition. But the money is out of this. Out of this, yep. Yeah, yeah the student, those student shields are a perfect example of how we can use them to bring more kids back in and keep them safe. Plus, we also have to adhere to town uh, purchasing drive to buy a policy. All right, Scott, you had your hand up there. Right. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to, I mean, maybe um, Paul said it, but I just wanted to hear it again. In all of the work that you guys have done over the last couple of weeks and Peg getting approval for things, so how were we able to uh, take advantage of the full amount of the grant, the full 2.1, or what, what was the total of the, the amount, able to reimburse? The full amount has been requested. It was approved by first level. Uh, up at uh, 
CFCD. He was uh, approved by Kathy Dempsey, the CFO of the Connecticut uh, Department of Education, and it was approved by the Jeff Lingley, who funds all the grants. So he, he funds every grant that we request. And awesome. It's a real, right. it, it, it's a real time uh, process now. It used to be pretty cumbersome. Now we can go online and request the money, and it should be there within a matter of days at most. Well, congratulations and thank you. And one other brief topic I want to touch on is we have technology purchases, and through uh, through the years, they've been funded by technology leads with PD Bank. There's been some concern by our external auditor that it should not be funded by should not should be the board of education should not be a town of the board. It should be a town and an MOB should be up to be the town and the board that having the board that make the least payments. The external auditor is touching base with the uh, attorney who crafted uh, the initial language for uh, that series of leases a couple of years ago, and we should have some resolution on that for sure. Okay, thank you. Any questions? All right, thank you. Okay, we're moving on to curriculum. Our committee report, Mr. Ward. Yes, Madam Chair. I want to bring attention to the you know the board members about the report that is in the uh, before we get to the curriculum. Uh, the one labeled "Double Public Schools uh, Pre K Twelve Curriculum Guide." Uh, Jonathan, but uh, as the uh, superintendent charge, uh, each year the last four or five years, the curriculum committee has asked, "Where are we? Where are we going?" And they give us an idea. And inside this packet. Very careful, give me the time. All the curriculums in town, the dates, the procedures, what we've done, what we uh, want to do, and plan things in the future. So, this is a very important document, and we get this annually at our meeting. The way we'll set up the point. So, if every knows what we're teaching in our public school, here's all the curriculum right here. They can make reference to it. That's the guide. It is. It's an excellent guide. Thank you, Dr. Bunn. It really is very clear. You can tell what is in progress, what what are what, what courses are new, and what courses there now that are now completed. So it's, it's a very good report. Thank you. So tonight, Dr. Bunn, we have a couple of approval courses we're going to talk about and some special guides. Dr. Bunn. Sure. If I can just take the privilege of saying a little bit more about that matrix. You do what I do during Mr. Henderson's business report. You, you count, you count curriculum guides in that document. So uh, I do. We're slightly between 250 and 300. But the point is, um, the curriculum committee over the past four years, which has been uh, Mr. Ward, Ms. Petiti, and Ms. Timpanelli, um, have reviewed and have endorsed and brought to this board, which has reviewed and endorsed over 145 of these. And that's the mark of a really strong district. That curriculum writing is continuous. It's the best form of professional development for our teachers because they get to get together, really study standards, really think about how to bring uh, any curriculum area to meet the needs of our current students. So it is, uh, despite that we love the later school start time committee, and we love the policy committee, the curriculum committee is where it happens, and that is a totally bipartisan effort of this Board of Education prior board to do great things for teachers learning But I am pleased to be here with you tonight. We, we have a couple of new courses first. Um, and I don't know, Ms. Timpanelli, if you'd like a, a motion first on the event for me to speak, or do you want me to speak first? I'll do either you'd like. Um, you speak first, and then we'll make a motion. So this time every year, we come to the board with potential new course proposals for the Trumbull High School Program of Study, which has to be printed uh, by the time you have your next meetings, right? And so this year we have two, and they're very important new courses. The first is uh, entitled Health 11, Mindfulness and Movement. 
Uh, the Trumbull High School class of 2023, which will be juniors next year, uh, is, as you know, under new graduation requirements. And they must take a physical education course and a health course every year. I want to say again, this board and prior boards forecasted that this would happen. And you started with a senior seminar course, you had health nine, you moved back into health 10 this past year. Well, now we need health 11. And uh, Mr. Descalo, who's the department chair of that group, has worked with his team to propose at this point a description that would work on the key areas of mindfulness and movement. Those two things uh, that really in a comprehensive wellness program get students reflecting on themselves, but also active in movement, right? So it's not necessarily what we used to think of as the old health course. But it's, it's up and coming ways to get students thinking about wellness. This course would meet for one marking period for one quarter credit. And uh, although I hate to say things are mandated because you ultimately have local control, you'll need to do this if you want these students to be able to graduate on time. And then we'll be able to come back and say this is what the curriculum would look like for this course. And, and you do that in your normal process. The second course, and I'd be happy to answer questions on that. The second course matches a key district goal. It matches a key goal that we have in other areas of expanding students' perspectives around social justice and around people uh, both similar to and different from themselves. You might remember that we've talked about in the past that state legislation, Connecticut Public Act 1912, uh, it's mandated that uh, every district in the state offer a course in these particular areas. And the title of the course, as well as the course description, come from the state of Connecticut. And it's African American Black and Puerto Rican Latino Studies. It's a four year course in the Social Studies Department. And in our scheme, it would be offered as an elective course to students in grades 10 to 12. So I want to be clear in saying that the board's requirement is to uh, the board's requirement is to offer the course, and then students can elect to take it. So it's not that every student must take it, although we might think that's a fine idea. Our mandate is to offer it. And about an hour before the meeting started, Ms. Robano, who's the social studies department chair at the high school, called me along with Mr. Cafferty, who is another social studies teacher at the high school. They attended a webinar uh, this, uh, today, they attended it. The State Department of Education is hosting these webinars this week as a way of introducing every district to this course. Uh, Mr. Garino is attending a webinar tomorrow on this, and students would be in the course for the entire year. They learn about perspectives on, uh, on these contributions to society, and the particular curriculum will be strongly influenced by the state curriculum on this and by state resources. But the thing I mentioned Ms. Rubano and Mr. Cafferty for is I was pleased, and they were really surprised, the State Department mentioned in the webinar how Trumbull is seen as a leader in this kind of effort. And I would point out that our ability to get it on the ground floor of this allows us to help shape the conversation. We have a high school with 2,200 students. We are a model in many ways for diversity, and this is a natural addition as an elective course for students. So I'll pause there because both of these courses come from the curriculum committee to the board uh, for your approval tonight. Okay. Uh, I'd like to make the motion and then we'll have a discussion. So can someone make the motion for me? Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. The approval of the new course proposal. All right, so we're going to ask for approval of the new course to health 11, mindfulness and movement, wellness, African American, Black and Puerto Rican, Latino. Yeah. I need a second. 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 Okay, so I think you only said second. Okay, so Mr. Taylor said second. Okay, any discussion? Any questions for Dr. Bud? No? Okay, I'll take the vote. Marie Petito. So, yes, in favor. All right, Tim Gallo. In favor. Mr. Ward. Yes, in favor. Jackie Marcel. Favor. Okay, Scott Kerr. Yes, in favor. Andy Taylor. In favor. And the Citizen Benelli. Yes, in favor. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on to the approval of the curriculum guide. These eight curriculum guides come to you from the November 5th meeting of the curriculum committee. And uh, most of them are new or highly revised courses. 
that again the board endorsed as ways to give students, particularly in the class of 23, more options uh, toward graduation. Some of these used to be combined into long four year courses, but making them half year electives with revised curriculum has allowed for more flexible scheduling. So the first two are from our visual arts department, which I would point out four years ago had two members and now has four strong members of that department with well oversubscribed courses. Visual art and design is a one semester foundation course. And uh, Ms. Duran spoke to the curriculum committee about how it really is seen as an introduction to, to key ways that you could use artistic resources at the high school and encourages students then to pursue intermediate art courses. This course, like the next one, is linked to the National Core Art Standard. The second course is a new course you authorized last year in mixed media. Uh, you saw a need and you supported the high school administration's need to have some more intermediate art courses and mixed media right away has attracted a strong student following which goes with their new arts credit for graduation and Ms. Willett who's uh, at from a high school this year from Booth Hill Elementary last year she spoke about the very ways in which this course looks both at culture and also at creating artistic products. I'll move next to several courses in our business education department and uh, both through the Perkins grant as well as through the board budget. We are really blessed to have our career and technical education courses developed in an ongoing way. This next class is a web design class and it's now focused on HTML and CSS coding. Ms. Tartaglia spoke about how the revision was necessary there because the students coming in from uh, to the high school now have much more digital literacy from the middle school than they used to. So this coding class has moved in a new direction. The fourth uh, curriculum guide this evening is the uh, business of fashion. Uh, fashion as a general course used to be in our family and consumer sciences department and was focused on uh, the actual making of textiles. But in alignment with many other districts, we moved it to the business education department and now it's focused on the business of fashion. Ms. Richards spoke to the curriculum committee about her enrollment in this course and about how really uh, this is cutting edge in terms of what's happening out there in the state, in the nation, in the world, uh, and fashion trends and the business marketing aspect of that. The fifth curriculum guide this evening is a new curriculum, a new course at the high school with strong enrollment in the business education department. It's called Investing in the Stock Market. It is a uh, secondary level uh, finance course. So students who have some introductory courses in finance and accounting can move on to investing in the stock market. Ms. Richards explained this curriculum to the committee as well as the child development curriculum. Uh, here's an excellent example. Child development used to be a full year course and the high school reported having difficulty getting sufficient students to take it for, to take it because it was a full year and difficult for them to fit in their schedules. Ms. Richards, from some experiences she had elsewhere, has retooled it as a one semester course and we really now have really strong enrollment in the course, which is nice to see. The seventh curriculum guide comes from our technology education department. Mr. Yaccarino spoke about automotive systems. Uh, again, we used to have an automotive two course, which was full year. Same issue because students had to lock into the same period for the full year. Now we have two half year advanced automotive classes. This automotive systems is one of them. And Mr. Yaccarino spoke about the Connecticut standards here. Now, Obviously, this takes advantage of the great resources Trumbull High School has as far as actual labs and vehicles, et cetera, where students can practice what they're learning in the comprehensive high school that we have. And finally, competitive recreational games is in our wellness department. Mr. Tisdall and Mr. Moore spoke to us. This is an upper class elective in the physical education part of our wellness department. And uh, students take this if they're interested in it above and beyond their core physical education health uh, requirements. And in fact, I, I just have to say, bringing the debate to a close, I think what you see here is the richness uh, of a comprehensive high school. And we are allowing student choice into the electives that interest them. 
and with 2,200 students and really appealing electives, we're able to sustain strong enrollment in all of these. So again, tribute particularly to curriculum members, committee members, but also to the full board, I would support your uh, endorsing all of these. Okay, I would like the board to make a motion for all of these, and then if you have a question, we can uh, ask Dr. Bush. Can someone make the motion? Hi, this is this is Scott. I would uh, make the motion that we approve the curriculum guides as presented by uh, Dr. Bud for visual art and design, mixed media, web design, the business of fashion, investing in the stock market, child development, automotive systems, and competitive recreational games. Okay, I'll second that. Second okay, does anyone have a question on any of these for Dr. Bud? Mr. Ward and Mrs. Petiti and I have seen these and we did have extensive conversations with the teachers who prepared them and they did an excellent job. So we'll leave it open for anyone else that might have a question. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I would just I would just say it's so exciting. I think I said this at the last meeting or the meeting before about the the effort that goes into creating these guides and how appreciative we are of uh, the staff that work on them. And uh, and I I'm just so excited to see the diversity of offerings as you uh, as you noted, Dr. Bud. So thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. All the uh, curriculum guides were wonderful, but I really loved how stations approach was used in the child development. Those stations were really great. I enjoyed going through them. So all the curriculums were good, but that use of stations, you know, brought you right back to elementary school and the use of stations. So. Anyone else? Just a comment. Uh, you realize there's a lot of work. Just to mention, we don't, uh, as a committee, we to do these to teach, but they work so hard. And a lot of these curriculum guides that come out of secondary or well, high school, some high school, are from the most of the front teachers. So their own teaching. And well, over the years, they said, we could do this a little bit different. Instead of offering one year, let's do it a half a year. And all the classes we asked for the enrollment of the number of students, and they've got a full load of these classes. It's a marvel the way to teach them. Thank you, Mary Jane. You're welcome. It's uh, it's really exciting to see them all when they come in and how they explain it. And it's, I have to say, I really enjoy looking at the curriculum. Sometimes I ask for some student work, and I did read a couple of them from Mr. Rogers' class, the law reviews. They were excellent. The kids looked the kids prepared. So it, it's just really exciting to see what they can think of. And I'm so happy because the curriculum comes from the staff when it comes from them, they have a passion for it. So they make sure that they're preparing a curriculum guide that's really in their, that they love and they want to impart that knowledge to the students. I think it's great. Great job, Dr. Bud. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm going to take the vote. Okay, Mr. Petiti. Mr. Gallo. Mr. Ward. Yes, Mr. Okay, Mrs. Marcel. Yes, in favor. Mr. Kerr. Yes, in favor. Caleb. In favor. And Mrs. Timpanelli in favor. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Okay. I don't think there's an other on the list if there's anything else. And if not, I'm going to look to Mr. All right. Mr. Ward made a motion to adjourn. Can I have a second? I second it. Okay. Have a good evening. Good night. Take care. Thank you.